The forces of the military orders are by no means discreet. Their public face is that of anachronistic knights clad in power armor on a holy crusade that happens to align with Pan Oceania's strategic goals. Their funding and main source of direction comes from one of the largest organizations in the sphere outside of O12 itself and draws troops from veterans of Pan Oceania's many war zones. The military orders are a cultural icon of Pan Oceania and to deny their existence and effect on the human sphere would be like sticking your head in the sand. But not much is known about the troopers beyond the knights, the support staff, the line troopers and the specialists. Who are they? Well, this video will answer that and we'll discuss the lore of all the unique military troops ranging from the humble crozier to the terrifying surf so that you can understand the military orders better. If you want to find out how such a diverse force came to be, I have another video talking about the foundation and the orders of the military orders of Pan Oceania. So go watch that and then come back and watch this. You don't have to watch it to understand this, but it's more good content. The Light Infantry of the Military Orders is by and far the most overlooked, besides the skirmishers, which might be on purpose. Military Orders is not a heavy infantry focused faction, despite the public face. Without the Light Infantry, the Knights of the Military Orders would be unable to sustain the combat requirements of their orders. Without the Light Infantry, the Military Orders may only have regiments of soldiers. With the Light Infantry supporting, they not only have armies of equally dedicated and pious souls to swell their ranks and fight across the sphere against the Combined Army, but enhance the logistics, quantic protection and leadership of the military orders. To be clear, while Knights spearhead the military orders, it is the Light Infantry of the Croziers and Order Sergeants who are the bulwark and body of the armies of the Neo-Vatican. We are going through some dark times, and both the human sphere and church need an army of volunteers, not to invite hatred or violence, but to bring peace and justice, to help defend the helpless and abused, and these volunteers can be none other than true Christians who manifest their faith in every single actions of their lives. Those who heed the church's call to mission and crusade, those who are willing to join the ranks of the croziers, the Cogitur Croziers are secular soldiers who bear the symbol of the cross in both their uniform and in their souls because the fact they are not clergy does not mean they are not religious or part of the church, quite the contrary. For Croziers to be a true Christian means living out a commitment. For those trooper, faith equals commitment. And Christian commitment is in fact the defence and protection of those in need and those who are powerless. This is why in an age where enemies loom large, it has never been more vital for true Christians to take action. Aware of this pressing need, the Church has called upon the faithful and has provided the means so that members of the community who have answered this call can not only become a shield, but an instrument in change in favour of a sphere governed by the true principles of the New Vatican Christianity. Thus, training centres sponsored by the Church, but attached to the Pan-Oceanian military complex, train the believers to become coditures, contributors to God's plans as soldiers of Christ. They then become bearers of the cross, the symbol of the faithful, which they hoist like a torch, a beacon hope of hope for all those who need their protection. There will be no danger or threat the Croziers cannot face, because their commitment to Pan Oceania and to the Church is born of the strongest and firmest conviction that can exist. The knowledge that what they are doing is right as well as necessary, because they are carrying out God's plan, a plan that cannot be delayed or hindered, so woe betide those who stand in their way. The military orders count on a small select light infantry regiment to support their knights in combat. In these times of crusades, these smaller units are staffed with veteran volunteers from other regiments who are drawn by action, faith and glory. However, the backbone of any order sergeant unit is made up of battle-hardened croziers who have been promoted to these prestigious regiments on the basis of their merits in battle. The order sergeant's organisational structure is identical to that of any other military force, except the command platoon is always in the hands of a father officer of the military order to which they belong. Brother Sergeant Regiments form a corps of seasoned veterans who, as experts in some military discipline, reinforce the rest of the Order's troops. According to the Operational Organization Charts, Escort Sergeants perform tactical support tasks or strike force functions as required by their mission specifications. It is always quite interesting to see the Order Sergeants on their way to battle. The more devout pray while the more prosanct listen to psycho music through their cranial implants, all of them strapped to their padded acceleration seats sharpening their swords and bayonets, making the cargo hold look like a forest of pointy, shiny blades. In those moments prior to the clamour of battle, sergeants smile with pious joy to encourage the rookie and hide their eagerness to fight and kill as soon as they jump off the vehicle. 
The church knows more about power than any other organisation in existence. After all, it has been playing this game for the last thousand years. And one thing it knows about power is that sometimes it takes physical forms, such as relics, objects that contain power by themselves. Sometimes people attribute power to these objects because they were owned by a holy person, a person of power or influence, or even because they were literally part of a saint's body. Other objects have power because of how they are used because of some kind of access they grant to the possessor. Since humanity expanded throughout the galaxy, this last category also includes artifacts of extraterrestrial origin, either because the knowledge they can provide, their potential use, or their value in shedding some light on the role of aliens in God's plan. In any case, relics have always been among the most precious items in the church's treasures and to protect them and look after them. It relies on qualified people known as curators who guarantee their works preservation. The discovery of the Neiman Zone on Paradiso was a turning point for the curator's responsibility and professional profile. The discovery of an object of alien origins compelled these experts to specialise in the insipid fields of xeno-engineering and xeno-linguistics, research areas in which the Neo-Vatican invested large amounts of capital and resources, becoming one of the main supporters of the human Toha exchange programs sponsored by O12 after contact was established with this alien race. As a rule, curators are part of the general staff of the Neo-Vatican and they are members of the Official Deal Conservator, the institute created by the Cure for the Management of Relics. However, since the Neiman Zone was discovered on Paradiso, some military orders have begun to recruit and train their own curators so as to lessen their technical dependence on the Cura. Thus, they have been able to build their own crypt to house and analyse all the alien re relics that they find in their field operations. However, every curator is required to document and catalogue each alien artifact they find and report it to the official deal conservatoire. This institution has the authority to reclaim any relic for study in its laboratories in the San Pietro di Neoterra. It is well known that the official deal conservatoire boasts some of the best xeno specialists in the entire sphere, all of whom were renowned scientists with a long publication list, with many of these publications designated highly classified by the Paradiso Coordinated Command. Nonetheless, the abilities of the military orders should not be underestimated, especially those belonging to the Order of Santiago and the Teutonic Order. The former because of their high-tech approach and vocation, and the latter because they have always been in contact with the alien vestige since their founding. Unlike the Officio del Conservatoire, military order curators are used to deploy in the field and follow their order's tactical teams to the sites where relics may be found. Such sites are often located close to the battlefront, or they may be of interest to the enemy, which means that these curators are no strangers to the violence of combat or to hasty excavations under heavy enemy fire, risks that are certainly worth taking if only to gain a better understanding of the power these relics hold and thus obtain a strategic advantage for the Neo-Vatican and for Pan-Oceania of course. There is good reason why the motto of the military order's knight commander is Fides Intrepido, or Fearless Faith, a compelling and unequivocal reason they are all men and women who have proven their faith and put their lives on the line to lead their troops. Always the vanguard in battle. The name Knight Commander designates a high ranking officer of any military order who commands their troops right on the battlefield. You will never see a Knight Commander issuing orders from the comfort of their headquarters or behind the screens of their office once the fighting has begun. Regardless of which unit of the order they may have risen from, these brave warriors home is the front line because in their capacity as leaders and officers, they embold all the best qualities of Christianity and, and know their duty is, as good Christians is to evangelize by example. A knight commander is a true warrior who never asks the troops to do anything that they themselves are not willing to do, as they always find occasions to prove it. There are no more hazardous positions of leadership in any of the military orders than this one. The casualty ratio of the knight commanders in battle is the highest in the entire Pan-Oceanian military complex. A bloodletting the neo vatican Cura had to put to an end on account of a direct recommendation by the Hexadrones. Each time one of them fell in battle, it represented a huge loss of experience and resources that seriously harmed all military orders without exceptions since the worsening conflict of Paradiso. However, since it was neither feasible nor desirable to change these officers' idiosyncrasies, the Cure demanded that from the general chapters of all orders that the Knight Commanders be better equipped so to increase their survivability in combat. Thus, they were supplied with holographic memenitis and comm shielding equipment to confound the enemy and ensure that we no longer obvious targets for enemy snipers. 
Although initially the Grand Masters and other leaders in the military orders were afraid that these officers would reject such impositions, they soon realised that their concerns were unfounded and that their trust in the virtue of these men and women had been insufficient, since all of them had taken a vow of obedience, a vow that their Christian honour made unbreakable. For every knight commander, this gave represents a new opportunity to remain faithful in their motto, a loyalty that they practise to the letter, for both words that make up that motto. On one hand, their unwavering faith in God guides them in their strife in a way that makes them always righteous, for it is an expression of the divine will of which they are executors. And on the other hand, it bolsters their fearlessness, because now they have a tool that allows them to take even more risks than before. It's important to remember that the title of knight commander derives from the word command, and this is what these officers do. But always in the vanguard and always looking for danger in the eye, just as their tradition and the military order's history of great victory dictates. Constantinos was always a thrill seeker, for a young Pan-Oceanian pilot with a compulsion to prove himself, driving a lunar rover plane at full speed with a disengaged co-pilot seemed like the obvious thing to do. That was exactly what he was doing the one ride he will never forget. Constantino was tasked with driving an ERT, an emergency response team, to the Magna Opera dome factory in the aftermath of a assassin a sabotage. Time was of the essence, but that day Constantino was less than focused. His girlfriend Nikki worked at that dome, a minute misjudgement, one that the onboard AI would have easily corrected for, turned into a serious collision. Constantino lost control of the vehicle and crashed into a crater wall. The ERT failed to make it on time and five people died in that dome. One of them was Nikki. Desperate from loss and guilt, Constantino decided to join a military order. Without contacts or influence, it seemed like the only way to recover Nikki from the cube bank and bring her back. Once enlisted as an order sergeant, Constantino worked fervently to excel within his unit and earn points with which to obtain a resurrection permit for Nikki and clear his conscience. He trained hard and pushed himself to the limit. He volunteered for the most dangerous tasks, which he earned the reputation of a man of action, ultimately opening the doors to the Order of the Holy Sepulchre, an elite unit that only takes the best. Deep down, Constantino was still the same thrill seeker who survived hellish situations simply because he felt comfortable in them. This internal ease was what piqued the interest of the Special Operations Command, who recruited him for its Indigo unit. That was how Constantino became a special agent, a reliable, ruthless, first-rate hunter in the service of God and Pan Oceania. He knows this is the only way to make resurrection and regain the love of his life. It is the right thing to do, and now he will do it, no matter the cost. A Grand Master is much more than a military leader. These are warriors anointed by God, gifted by the ability to be fair and the courage needed to show mercy. Honest, upright and dignified, a Grand Master should be an example of purity and restraint. They lead with a clear mind and forgive with a pure heart. Even when they make mistakes, they are quick to right them and amend for them with fair repentance. They are the definition of the ideal knight in God's service. Their work is to lead the Order and its knights in their consecrated task of imparting justice where it is needed. Every Grand Master knows that the human sphere is a beautiful place that, unfortunately, is threatened by great evil. There are obstacles that persistently hinder the efforts of the military orders to maintain justice and peace. There is no bigger threat than the Combined Army, the embodiment of evil. Until that threat is removed from the human sphere, the existence of the military orders in their actual warring and armed incarnation is fully justified. For that reason, Grandmasters of every order are elected based on their ability to rise to the gravity of circumstances. Circumstances will ask for strategic and military knowledge as well as management and financial skills. The authority of a Grand Master is unquestionable inside the Order, and their power is virtually absolute in everything related to the politics and war. Elected by a council of friars known as the Thirteen, Grand Masters only answer to the Pope and to the Cure when it suits them, out of consideration and political strategy. The position has life tenure, but it is customary for Grand Masters to lead their knights into combat from the front line, so the hazards of battle ensure that some of them hold the post briefly. At present, this behaviour is discouraged, but some still turn a deaf ear to the advice, with generally fatal consequences. Even if a Grand Master is resurrected, they won't return to the position, but instead assign advisory, diplomatic and charity work within the Order. However, there are those who opt for an identity change to rejoin the Order as mere knights and continue to offer their lives to the Lord's work in a more direct way. Even if the Grand Master's authority and control inside the Orders are practically absolute, they are obliged to act and behave as exemplars for their knights. It is for that reason that some of them ignore the call for prudence and responsibility and throw themselves into battle like any other crusader moved by faith. Crusaders for which they are the greatest bordermen, the Lord's glory.
The medium infantry of the military orders are much like their light infantry brethren and help support the knights of the military orders. However, they are much more specialised in the roles, of whether it be the watchdogs of the church, advanced drop troopers, or even specialised combat medicine. All three make up vital components of the military order supply and command structure that is required in order to execute God's will across the human sphere. Vertas von Libertat the truth shall make you free, motto of the Special Security Detachment of the Order of Preachers. It is said that the Dominicans are known as the Hounds of the Lord because of the play on the words, their Latin name, Dominian Canis. However, the real reason for this name is due to the ferocity in with which they developed their work as the watchdogs of the church. First during the Inquisition and now as a Special Security Detachment. The Black Friars, a name derived from their clothing as from their grim reputation, they are the twilight gardens of Pan Oceania. Their designated mission is to provide security against any possible infiltration by undercover agent or enemy powers like Shabasti, alien threat. As servants of God in Pan Oceania, Dominicas are the thin black line that separates good from evil, peace from chaos. The responsibility and the constant threat of the enemies of their religion and their nation is what defines them and keeps them centered on their mission. Conscious of their task and mission, the Black Fires do not waver in their commitment to keeping Pan Oceania safe with the utmost ferocity, as it is befitting the Hounds of the Lord. Vescrucis de Gratia, the power of the cross by God's grace. Motto of the Crusader Brethren Insignia. Crusader Brethren, or the Cross Bearers, are a special immediate deployment unit serving within the Pan Oceanian military orders. Given the danger level of the operations they execute, the redeeming value of the service within the Brotherhood of Crusaders, in respect of a resurrection bulla, is that double of a regular sergeant of arms. Members of this unit specialise in airborne, orbital and space actions, and they are selected from among the most dedicated and capable of order sergeants. Their mission? To bear the cross, symbol of Christ, and stab it into the heart of the enemy. Crusader brethren carry heavy armour and protective gear as they know they will be deployed into the middle of the most intense firefights. Every time a force of military orders is halted on the battlefield due to enemy fire, caught in a situation where they can't advance and crush the enemy, then they will launch the Crusader brethren. They streak across the vacuum of space or several kilometres of atmosphere, falling like meteorites onto their objectives. What they do to win when they engage the enemy in combat stays between them and God himself. But if you ask, you will discover the notion of stabbing the cross into the enemy's heart is an absolutely literal description. If there is one building that holds special importance in the history of the Order of the Hospital, it is the Sacra Infirmis. If the care and protection of pilgrims, especially those who were ill, was the Order's lovely motif, the Sacra Inferma was the facility where the treatments were carried out. Each time its official seat was relocated, the building would be one of the first to be equipped by the Order, and very often the rest of the structures would be arranged around it. While that is true, historically, the Order's Sacra Inferma on the Isle of Malta on Earth is the most prominent. Its equivalent in San Petra is very prestigious as well, and that of the St. John of Scovodorin, the current seat of the Order, is unparalleled. The city's Sacra Firma is considered one of the most sophisticated hospitals in the sphere, almost equal to that of a Modernat. in addition to being one of the main combat medicine research and training centres. Over time, the Order of St. Lazarus, a specialised sub-order of the Order of the Hospital, has progressively taken charge of managing this Order's infirmaries. The Order of St. Lazarus is devoted to the ill and the perilous, and all its members have some kind of medical qualification. However, the grim and brutal realities of recent conflicts where many of the operations are carried out covertly has turned hospitals and medical centres into relevant targets, a fact that has forced the Order of St. Lazarus to toughen up the hard way. All the violent attacks suffered by medical facilities of the Order of Hospital, none has had a greater impact than the vicious assault on the Sacra Infirma at St. John of Scobardoronin during the neo-colonial wars. After declaring it a target of strategic importance due to its relevancy as a recovery centre for the wounded, especially officers and commanders coming from all the different theatres of operation during that conflict, the state army deemed that its destruction would mean the decapitation of the Pan-Oceanian military complex leadership. As a result, the Order of St. Lazarus personnel saw that how the small security detachment at the Sacre Inferno was barely able to stop the elite troops deployed by Eugene who advanced relentlessly, leaving a trail of murdered patients behind. Even though the state commandos were ultimately eliminated after a desperate battle, the Order of St. Lazarus had to face the fact that they had not been able to honour their oath to protect those under their care. This could never happen again. 
The Order resolved to create a corps that would run field hospitals and defend it if the need arose. The core of this unit would be comprised of few members of the security detachment who had survived the assault on the infirmers, who would be hence known as the Fraternus Expunger of the Order of St. Lazarus. However, their small number was not enough to meet the needs of the Order, which needed to recruit more talent in order to have elite personnel in each of its facilities. To this end, they made a call to crusade addressed to the members of the different Pan-Oceanian Special Forces. They were looking for devoted men and women who already had some knowledge in the field of medicine or experience as paramedics to expedite their training, which was intense during their indoctrination, as well as in the close combat techniques characteristics of the military orders and those most necessary in their usual operational environments. To this purpose, they requested the services of the skillful Shona Karo, former Aristea star and instructor of the Knights of Justices, who would train them in the way of the sword, so that they could wield their monofilament blades not just as scalpels, but as swords. But only the best among them could aspire to be the defenders of an infirmer, so a merit-based selection criteria was established. Such recognition is only obtained by serving at least two terms as a medical specialist in the Pan-Oceanian Military Complex Special Operations Command Joint Operations, or at the service of the Order of the Hospital Ambulance Corps in some crusade territory. Additionally, those who are worthy during their service are awarded two pro merito crosses. A decoration bestowed by the Order of St. Lazarus for being in battle would be, in theory, directly promoted to the sought after position of prestige. However, these men and women's superior skill makes them valuable resources for the Pan Oceanian military complex, especially for Svalharina Winter Force which makes extensive use of their abilities, which are much needed in the distant and isolated scenarios in which the force must operate. As a consequence, by resorting to all sorts of bureaucratic subterfuge, their enrollment in an infirmer may be delayed until the end of their service cycle, or even until the beginning of the next one. In the meantime, their infirmers will continue to uphold the vows of commitment to others, for both on the front lines of battle, on the frozen frontier of Svalharema, or in the off-the-record operations always devoted to their duty as protectors and healers in the name of God and Pan Oceania, whether in an infirmary or field hospital under attack or part of a commando force on the ground, they proudly wear the cross of the Order of St. Lazarus on their tunic, which will not be as white and unblemished as they should be because of the blood, not of their patients, but from their enemies. The heavy infantry of the military orders are the stars of the show, usually each representing a single order and with it a single set of specialist troops from combat search and rescue to quantic warfare and anti-piracy operations. Each knight represents an officer's worth of experience, years of honed military expertise focused into the best power armour and gear the order can buy and pointed toward the sphere's problems. Be it an overambitious Yujing operation, commercial conflicts on Don's outer islands or boarding actions against the combined army. He neither gives nor asks for respite. Kill them all and God will recognise his own. Attributed to Father Officer de Frenzen, Hessian Horn Action, Paradiso. Gabriel de Frenzen was a young, successful programmer who lived a depraved life full of excess. But after suffering a spectacular nautical accident which almost cost him his life, he rethought his behaviour. De Frenzen found God and decided to apply for admission to the Holy Order of the Temple. The Order offered him a way to sanctify his longing for action, dedicating himself for the work of the Lord, and also a way to apply his technical skills in his service. De Frenzen delivered himself body and soul for, to his training for the Holy War in the difficult Santiago of Neoterra Instruction Monastery in Aquila. With the last of his savings, he financed his own combat implants of Templar manufacturer, allowing him to form his accelerated combat routines. De Frenzen became a disciplined Templar knight who received his baptism by fire in the death throes of the neo-colonial wars. On the battlefield he proved to have the bulletproof faith and security and a touch of an indomitable beast. At the end of the conflict he returned to Neo Terra where he continued to hone his military and battle programming skills. By that time he had already earned a fearsome reputation as a smart and fierce warrior. After the dissolution of the temple and the investigations of heresy carried out by the Dominican Order in the name of the Holy Inquisition, the Frenzen was subjected to deep interrogation and scrutiny to ascertain whether he'd been involved in that ominous and heretical plot. He had to face a court-martial and he freely submitted to an ordeal, a trial of God. 
of which he emerged victorious. Once he was declared innocent of the charges of apostasy and programming clandestine artificial intelligences, he was permitted to transfer to the order of the hospital. However, his old ties to the temple are considered a failing and a stain on his spirit and his file, which is why he can never ascend beyond the current rank in his order. During the Ariadnan commercial conflicts, the Frenzen was assigned to units of mercy, those responsible for recovering the wounded from the front lines and prisoner rescue. These missions performed by the Hospitallers of Mercy have a very high risk level which is why they require the maximum precision. The Frenzen proved to be fully capable of commanding these units, taking care of even the smallest details in the preparation and execution of these missions. Years later, during the Second Party's so offensive, the Frenzen name would pass into the annals of the Order in Hessian's Horn where his team was ambushed and stopped the Combine Army's reinforcements. The time gained by such a small Mercedian unit under the Frenzen's command allowed Pan-Oceanian troops to smash the Morat rear guard forces, to rescue numerous prisoners and to capture important technical and strategic information. The Frenzen's impressive and extensive track record over the years speaks of a man of commitment to his duty and his mission, a soldier of God willing to make every sacrifice for the innocent. Always true to his pledge, the Frenzen has been wounded on numerous occasions and some of his neuro implants are meant to mitigate the physical damage sustained in the duels against the lethal cyber assassins of the Combined Army. Despite having been on the brink of death on so many occasions, he has always made it out alive, sometimes in such outrageous, unlikely ways that it could be argued that he is not wanted in the afterlife, which he takes as a sign that God judges that he still has a lot of work to do in the land of the living. However, regardless of all his heroic feats, the Order of the Hospital will always be suspicious of him because of his past as a Templar Knight. Being a special operative and a team leader, any deviation from the original plan or orders is closely scrutinised when he's in command, not only by his commanders, but by the Order of Preachers. Take for instance the time when he ordered his unit of mercy to attack a convoy of prisoners encountered en route to the original target's extraction point. Upon his return, he had to face a lengthy post-operational inquiry, during which time he was relegated to training cadets at St. John Scovador Eventually, all accusations of having jeopardised the mission were dismissed thanks to the testimony of the men and women under his command. He was allowed to return to active duty, but never received an apology from his superiors. Defenzen knows his career in the order of the hospital has reached a plateau and this situation can be remedied by requesting a transfer. He is fully aware that he will always be in the crosshair of his commanders and that the order of preacher hounds won't leave him alone, but he doesn't care. He doesn't need more promotions or to rise further in the hierarchy because he knows the real duty of a true knight is to always stand by the weak and the innocent, and that requires being on the front line. Dust, sweat and steel to sum up to the lives of true warriors of the lords, knight like Gabriel Defenzen and pray to God will have more like him. Jean d'Arc, 1412 to 1431, was a French saint and heroine. Ardently religious, at the age of 13, she suddenly started hearing voices which she interpreted as a divine command to liberate her country from English domination. At 17, she was given a small contingent of troops by the Dauphinois of France, which she commanded to a series of victories that heralded the downfall of the English forces. She was taken prisoner by the English and accused of heresy and witchcraft. She was sentenced by the Inquisition to death by burning. She was later canonised by the Pope in 1920. Under the auspices of Pan Oceania, the Maid of Orleans project was aimed to create a military leader capable of inspiring modern troops through the worst of the fight. They need someone with extreme charisma, someone capable of turning the tide of combat through sheer courage, zeal and ardour. Pan Oceanian analysis decided that the troops with a Christian background were likely to respond favourably to such a figure. The recreation of the maid was given tactical capabilities far surpassing those of the original and was subjected to extensive military religious training inspired by the methods of the Pan-Oceanian military orders. Once her training was finalised, she entered the Hospital Order where she was required to persevere in earning the respect of her brothers from the lowest rung of the order. She was able to rise in rank during the blizzard skirmishes against Yujing and Svaharima and when the new colonial wars broke out, Joan of Arc, already a sister officer of the Oites of the Hospitaller, was transferred to the Order of Santiago for the defence of the Mars Saturn circuit. By the end of the tour, the maid was a living legend. Having served with her was a source of pride across the entire Pan Oceanian army. She was ordered to oversee the defence of Neo Terra to soothe the ears of the masses during the setback of the airspace campaign in the Divining Line. Rumours of her arrival on the front line are enough to raise the spirits of troops and inspire them to impossible feats. Under her command, soldiers fight to the last breath with a ferocity and courage and strength unrivaled in any battlefield. Her presence in a fight is seen as an unequivocal sign of imminent victory. Joan has been described as touched by the hand of God, her eyes are a burning ember and her voice is a hurricane. She embodies the very concept of an aura of charisma and power. As mother warrior of all pan Oceanian soldiers, she is admired by all women and beloved by all men. The most natural thing in life for Jean d'Arc is always to lead the attack and be the first in line of fire. 
Her combat instincts drive her into the fray regardless of battle conditions. However, in spite of her unrelenting desire for action, she is also aware that a good leader should adapt to the combat environment, that carrying out naval assaults is not the same as leading an attack through the thickets of Paradiso. For this reason, as well as the customised gear she usually carries onto the field and in front of media, Jones sometimes uses a lighter model of mobility armour, sacrificing protections for better speed and manoeuvrability. Equipped in this light armour, the Maid of Orleans is the ideal choice for the Pan-Oceanian military complex to lead harassment attacks against superior forces. In this type of operation, speed is key, reaching the objective rapidly, causing the most damage possible and leaving before the enemy can organise a coordinated response. With her mobility armour, the beautiful and fearsome Joan is perfectly capable of unleashing hell upon her adversaries, converting herself into a true messenger of divine wrath. Kyle Hawkins is not like us, not you, not me. Almost no one has dedicated their life to a dream, a dream as difficult as is risky. He did. Hawkins was one of those children fascinated by the Aristea experts in the art of the sword, and at the early age he went to kenjutsu classes in one of the dojos that popped up due to the popularity of sword discipline in that recent spectacle sport. However, while most of their classmates only practiced for fun or fashion, Hawkins had a greater purpose. Not only wanted to outdo himself, but to assist people in need. Coming from a very Christian family, very active in their community, Kyle soon felt the call to join the Lord's ranks. Given his training and his proactive spirit, the military order seemed a more fitting option than his priestly vows. Joining the order of the hospital was like a dream come true, but only the beginning of his journey. His devotion didn't prevent him from questioning the role of knights in the order in its divine plan, and he didn't let his faith justify everything. These weren't the best traits to have to move up in an organisation like the Order of Hospital, but on the other hand, these traits drew the attention of Gabriel de Fergan, assigned to training duties while he was investigated for a breach of orders during a unit of mercy operation. De Fergan was able to see the flames burning in Hawking Tower and decided to help him. The Knight of the Mercy's guardianship served to temper his fighting nature, but it did very little for his prestige inside the Order, since de Fergan was a controversial figure judged by both his character and his distant past as a Templar Knight. Therefore, Hawkins was the best fighter of his class, but didn't sign out in any other disciplines or have prestige in the order. It isn't surprising then that during his trial period where he was first allocated to a routine deputy post in Paradiso's rearguard, that allegation ended in a border incident with the state empire with a cosmolite in between. So everything is classified and we know very little about it. The thing is that Hawkins was involved in more than one fight and showed an unusual bravery. Still present in successful operations where it could no longer be blamed and experience his folly. If you ask him, he will make light of it saying he does his duty as a hospitaler knight and he will blush like it was the first time he had ever thought about it. He will show a complete opposite reaction though if you ask him about the lives he has taken because all of them, however justified, still weighs on his conscience. He doesn't enjoy killing and will not hesitate if the lives of the innocent or his comrades are at stake. If you get in his way with hostile intentions, you will become another life that is taken that will weigh on Hawkins' consciousness but only when the mission is complete and his people are safe and sound. From that first operation, whether by luck, the Lord's will, or his total commitment to his duties, Hawkins has been involved in several more missions that guys like us aren't entitled to know about. During his career, he has even crossed paths with figures such as Deferenzen, Shona Caro, Brother Constantino, and even a former Garkin operative. Outstanding agents who have influenced his combat style, taking it further from the standard tactics of the Order of the Hospital. But deep down, Hawkins is still the same. He is that good, upright boy that unabashedly points out any uncomfortable truth. He is an attitude that hasn't done much good for his position in the Order of the Hospital, despite all of his achievements. However, he doesn't care as long as he can keep serving God and people, because he isn't just a dreamer and a fighter. Kel is fundamentally a protector. You have met few such people since we are not cut from the same cloth as Hawkins. He is made of real hero material. Missio Deo, Mission of God, the new model of the Order of the Hospitaller of St. John of Scovidorino. The hospital is the single most powerful and influential military order in Pan-Oceania, based in the imposing fortress monastery of Scovidorino on the ironically inhospitable Svalharima. Hospitallers are the warrior monks with a double rank, both religious and military. Brother, sub officer, father officer, grandmaster, brigadier. Secluded in their monastery, they devote their time to prayer and to honing their martial skill. In battle, their religious fervor makes them fearsome and unrelenting. In keeping with their origins as advocates for alien pilgrims, they have specialized in high risk rescue missions sanctified by His Holiness the Pope. Hospitaler Knights are one of the pillars of the Pan Oceanian presence on the conflict ridden Svalharema. 
Crusaders for faith and country, they are aware of their mission is always to be ready for the call of duty, which always comes at the darkest hour. They know their vocation is an instrument of salvation, and they must relinquish the meagre, trifling rewards of selfish quests for worldly fame. Instead, they place the whole of their bravery and spur of sacrifice and service of Pan Oceania, the church, and their companions. Divindis, God is proven in righteousness. Historical watchwords of the Pan Oceanian Father Knights passed down to the Knights of Justice. Deniquim Colium, Heaven at Last, Ancient Crusader Battle Cry by the Knights of Justice. The bloody and brutal combats during the Paradiso Third Offensive took a huge toll amongst the Father Knights, leaving their ranks depleted and a strong feeling of loss amongst members of the various Pan Oceanian military orders. As figureheads of the hyperpowers forces, the Father Knights were always asked to the forefront of battle, leading the troops into the fiercest fights and a high risk tactical role, especially when facing such enemies such as the relentless Combine Army. Determined to keep and preserve the veteran troops who have proven themselves essential in the Paradiso Front, the High Command created the special training and technology upgrading program that would increase the chances of survival in battle. Thus, they were equipped with an experimental armor mod with increased mobility, more resistant than standard orc trooper, but just as fast which would allow them to engage in close combat with the enemy more easily and quickly. They also implemented advanced training programs for close combat techniques. This program would include training sessions by former Aristea champion Shona Karo, a swordmaster who was associated with pan Oceanian military complex as an ancillary instructor. The Father Knights who finished this training and wore the new Orc Armager Mark IV armor certainly became much deadlier and more effective troops than they were before. It was a qualitative leap that they wanted to emphasize with a change of designation, resurrecting, and a restructuring of the organization. The old units, Father Knights, many of which had been so severely decimated a small number of troops made deployment tactically impossible, were dissolved and in their numbers incorporated into the new Knights of Justice. The Order of the Hospital, the main promoter of this initiative, established the billet of its Knights of Justice in Svalharimov, where the unit had their baptism by fire during the Iskol frontier attacks, and asserted their reputation as shepherds of men who know how to lead troops in the thick of battle. These warrior priests are capable of looking them in the eye and kindling their hearts with fiery oratory to make them truly believe that they will crush their enemies because it is God's will, because it's the right thing to do, and because it must be done. Although the Knights of Justice Hospitallers were the first to set foot on a battlefield, their counterparts in the Teutonic Order, known as the Richt Order, did not lag, as they quickly joined in the defence of the Northern Front in Australia, where their actions would turn imminent defeats into resounding victories. And this was because nothing can impede these warrior priests in combat. No matter what order they belong to, all Knights of Justice are veteran warriors who believe that each task entrusted to them is a sacred duty that any action, even the most extreme acts of violence, which they must administer with the most absolute devotion. Honorum Immaculum, Unblenished Honor, motto of the Order of Santiago as after its refounding as a military order. The Order of Santiago, with the blessing of Pan Oceanian in 012, has taken on the task of providing assistance and protection to the pilgrims and the circulars using these space routes. A great number of Pan Oceanian civilians use these commercial lines covered by the circulars to make pilgrimages to the holy site of Earth in Neo Terra. The Order of Santiago, at the behest of Pan Oceania and O12, assumes the task of providing and coordinating aid and protection to the pilgrims and the circulars that travel the pilgrimage routes, as it would do in ancient times. The Knights of Santiago are part of the security detachment deployed by the circulars by Starmada, the naval division of O12's Bureau Aegis, to serve as military attaches under international command. With Pan Oceanian military complex, the Knights of Santiago hold naval officer ranks and are usually stationed on vanguard ships in both Pan Oceania's Amara and spacecraft belonging to the Order itself. The members of the Order of Santiago are some of the best trained and most specialized troops in the human sphere. The operational role of its boarding units is to storm seas and secure spaceship and facilities, both in deep space and in planetary orbits. This type of operation almost drives them to the front line. The Knights must carry out insertions at high speed, following assault vectors that exploit the smallest gap and point spent systems of the enemy ships. Crammed into the accelerator seats of the boarding pods, they are subject to hours of pain and fatigue, caused by the high velocity maneuvers required to reach their target while avoiding incoming defensive gunfire. Once they reach the enemy's spacecraft hull and manage to breach it, the Knights of Santiago must fight their way through compartments and airlocks to seize and secure each of the six each of the ship's sections fiercely fighting in close quarters tooth and nail against the enemy. These actions are generally death trapped, also the fastest and most effective way to board the ship, and therefore the Order's favourite choice.
The Knights know that their patron saint, Apostle James the Great, favours and always rewards risky enterprises when they are undertaken with faith and most indomitable courage. Padre Inquisitor Mendoza, the Crusader of Flame, the flame of the Lord punishing with his fire the wicked and the damned, the terror of those who harbour evil in their hearts, the nightmare of betrayers and pious souls, the soldier of God who is always righteous for he bears Jesus Christ in his heart and his task is just and necessary, the champion of the Hexadome and of Paradiso Front, the grand defender of the cross of the Holy Church who puts his life on the line hundreds of times for all our sakes and has delivered the sphere from its worst evils it has ever had to face. This is Mendoza, the flame of truth. It sounds good, doesn't it? Of course it sounds good. The presentation is a masterpiece of marketing, a proper hook for the audience and a huge bunch of lies. None of it is true, and there is one person who can attest to it. It's me, because after all, I am Mendoza myself. For, well, at least an aspect of him who does all the things that he's admired for. No, I'm not the one who jumps into the hexadrome, nor am I the one granting interviews, signing t-shirts, filming hollow productions, or living under the spotlight and basking in fame and success. I'm just the one performing all his dangerous scenes, both in fiction and in real life. I'm his stunt double. The one who does all the heavy lifting and steps aside so he can come and take all of the credit. But hey, that's the life of a stuntman, so please, don't think I'm complaining. Do my job. Get paid handsomely. I have good insurance with a contract for a cube recovery and a guaranteed resurrection within a five year period. It's top of the line platinum account, on par with a C-level exec. In return, I just have to risk my life in style to make him look good and to give you guys an adrenaline rush when you see him. And especially when you feel them. Yeah, because those sensor productions are key here. Whole films are easy to shoot. You only need a budget big enough to virtually recreate any environment, location, or threat and make it indistinguishable from reality. But a sensor productions are completely different matter. The audience is going to feel exactly what the actor feels. So you simply can't recreate a cliff in post-production. You have to stand on top of it with a mega crocodile waiting in the water with its jaws open because the audience has to feel the pull of gravity the wind on their face, the impact when they hit the water, and the teeth of the beast tearing at the clothes of the protagonist. And no producer wants to risk a superstar by shooting these scenes, let alone having the viewer feel the actor's fear. You need a stuntman for that. Someone who is capable of surviving shooting that scene and not feeling fear, like me. Yeah, I'm sure you recognise that scene from Escape from Paradiso too, and yes, it was me performing it. That day I think Mendoza was on a promotional tour. Anyway, I don't want you to think that Padre Inquisitor Mendoza was a wuss either. No, far from it. You've already seen him in the Hexadrome. He's a tough guy who can actually fight with elegance and make it look spectacular. Which is exactly the kind of show you need in Aristea. Surely he could show up in the thick of a paradiso front and successfully lead a charge to sneak a position, dodging enemy fire and make it alive despite having risked everything to be an inspiring example both to the troops and all those watching him later on home in the comlog screens. It's more likely that he could do it, but we'll never know, because no network executive will allow their golden goose to take such a risk, no matter how good this could be for Padre Inquisitor Mendoza's brand, for the network and for the Neo-Vatican Church, which is one of the major shareholders. But a stunt double? Now that's a totally different thing. To tell you the truth, I don't come cheap. I've been biomodified to be able to show off on screen to improve my survival skills and to look something like Mendoza from the Hexadron. I can do everything the Aristea hero does for far less money and far less investment risk. And that's why they want me and not for any other reasons. Anyway, I'm not an actor. I was hired on account of my past as an indigo special operator in the Panoceani military complex and because of my fearlessness when shooting dangerous scenes. This is the most important thing in a sense of production, because the audience must feel the boost of adrenaline blocking out anything else. And I'm really good at this. Never thinking of the consequences of what I'm doing, but acting is beyond me. It's just not my thing. When I show up in public, I always have a marketing and PR team from the network whispering in my ear exactly what I'm supposed to say, who I'm supposed to smile at, and what I'm supposed to do, and how so that I look like the Padre Inquisitor Mendoza everyone knows. And if this line of communication is ever cut for any reason, that's when I start sweating and panicking in a way I never do when I'm in combat or shooting Mendoza's absurdly dangerous scenes for the sense of production. Pure panic, I swear. Fortunately, the network usually prevents this sort of situation. I'm sent to take the spot in the front that has been pre-arranged with high command. I make my appearance just a 
at the right time, I thrash the bad guys, I blurt out a couple of promotional slogans, and I get away with the help of corporate exfil team. Just as it is said in Escape from Paradiso 3, Padre Inquisitor Mendoza does not seek gratitude or some reward. He's a man on a God-given mission, and seeing it fulfilled is the only thing that can bring him satisfaction. There's no doubt my job is a dangerous one, an extremely dangerous one, because for maximal promotional effect, Mendoza must be in the thick of combat, performing tasks as heroic as they are inconceivable, just like in the Hexagnome or any of the Maya production. That is my job, to leap into danger head on. You might think I'm crazy, but it's actually not so big a deal. The network has assured me that they will recover my cube and bring me back in an upgraded l host so I can go back to work as soon as possible. There's nothing to be afraid of. Though, I must admit it worries me a little to know that I'm not the first one to fill this position, and that there have been two others before me. What happened to them, I sometimes wonder. From what I can understand with certain remarks and insinuations, None of them quit to enjoy a peaceful requirement, which means they died doing their job, which is to say my job, and both of them surely had platinum resurrection accounts too, so the network didn't bring them back in a new ale host if they had to hire me. That means they couldn't recover them because there was nothing left to recover to be honest. It's not a pleasant thought, but this is why they pay me such a high salary and all those hazard bonuses. Christus Fenty, Christus Regnant, Christus Imperitat. Christ conquers, Christ reigns, Christ governs. Motto of the Teutonic Order. The Order of the Teutonic Knights of St. Mary in Jerusalem was created through a papal bull on the eve of the new colonial wars. Their mission was to become the spearhead of the Holy Mother Church in war zones and border territories to defend the sacred rights of the Neo-Vascan Church by force of arms. The Teutonic Knights were headquartered on Paradiso where they took part in the Neo-Colonial Wars and have subsequently distinguished themselves with bravery in the fight against the alien combined army. It is unusual to see the Teutonic Knights outside of Paradiso, although there are plenty of rumours about them all around the sphere. They are said to be grim and somewhat brutal, and that their base of operations is far from a command centre. Far on the northern front, they have single-handedly guarded the border. It is said that the Teutonic Knights are characterised by their unwavering faith and their frenzied warrior fervour, and that they are the most fanatical in combat. In order to preserve such a lofty reputation, the Order's discipline is marked by a strict discipline. Its members are provided with the best physical training value in hand-to-hand -hand combat above all else, as the ultimate goal of every member of the Order is to obtain glory in battle. After the fall of Streslau Fortress Monastery, when a weakened Teutonic Order needed to reinforce its ranks, only the Magister Knights were able to live up to the high Teutonic standards. The conditioning these warriors are subject to is not only physical but mental. It requires a kind of strength and determination that many would consider suicidal but which actually is the result of an extreme notion of bravery that can only be found in the medieval epic poems. Teutonic knights fight like desperate men who do not know danger. They usually greet their enemies with a volley at short distance and then, without missing a beat, they charge into close quarters, attacking with their swords, pistol whipping the enemies, displaying such a rage and frenzy. One would think that they were a legion of furious lunatics unable to stop until they littered the entire battlefield with dead bodies of the adversary. In hoc signo vince, with the symbol you will conquer, motto of the Order of Montessa. There came a moment in which the operative role of the Knights of Montessa was not enough to fill the needs of the service and combat feats of the Order bent on glorifying in battle. The Knights of Montessa are famous for playing hard, they are stubborn, powerful and gallant. As mechanised infantry, they have always been the bravest in the battle and the first to be placed into danger. Hence their evolution to turn into a motorised unit was the most obvious change. At first, only a handful of small teams received the roaring Baltacorp and Pala turning them into a spearhead, a connaissance unit able to reach the enemy before anyone else. The success of their operations in Eastern Slav Dava and their natural fit to join the operations of the Shock Army of Aconcimento and the rest of the military orders with a special mention of Joan of Arc convinced the Grand Masters of the Order and the High Command of Pan-Oceanian Military Complex that this should be the future of the unit's operations. After the savage and crow battle of Gerolstein, in which most of the Order's armed vehicles were destroyed or abandoned in the battlefield, the new Grand Master took the decision to completely change the role of the Montessa in battle. The lost vehicles would not be replaced, and every father knight that fought in the front line and was not attack pilot would be given a Baltacorp Impala. This was received with a great deal of enthusiasm which shortened the adaptation period, and in a few weeks, the Cavaleros of Montessa were in the front line again, riding their swift mounts. 
as a motorised heavy unit, the Montesters are now where the action is, and it has always been the Order's wish since its creation, for the glory of God. Deus Vault, God willing, the motto of the Order of the Holy Sepulchre. The Order of the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre is stationed on Earth, with the mission being the last line of defence for the Pan-Oceanian territories and the Church's sacred sites. Its members are chosen among the elite troops of the other orders, so all of them are veteran, battle season father officers. The Sepulchrist Knights, all of them close combat experts, comprise special security and heavy assault units, serving as a challenging example to all other Pan-Oceanian officers. The Knights of the Holy Sepulchre guard the cradle of humanity and the sacred sites because they are considered to be the best of the best and their history confirms it. During the failed Washer Lily Offensive in Hong Kong during the Neo-Colonial Wars, the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre Battalion stood firm until the end, commanded by Abbot Colonel Actuna. His men fought like lions and did not budge from their positions until the last man in the decimated Pan-Oceanian fighting force was evacuated. They then withdrew from the battlefield in perfect combat formation. No officer of the victorious Yu Jing army dared to challenge them in their retreat. The Sepulchrist Knights abandoned the field as though they had just left the military parade, proud in their head-to-toe blue armour and their dark robes billowing in the room. They climbed onto the aerial transport while Yu Jing army watched them depart with a mixture of admiration, respect and relief. However, this was not the last time the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre had to deploy to save the day. The Paradiso Front had become a true crucible for the reputation of these genuine soldiers of Christ as lone and unbeatable warriors. When the battle was most intense, that is when they were needed the most, and that is when they had never failed to answer the call of duty and sacrifice every drop of their blood if necessary. Whenever it was imperative to hold a position or contain the enemy advance, but deployed resources and times were scarce, a small attachment of Sepulchrists would be mobilised. Sometimes it was just a single warrior, especially as the conflict dragged on. Their casualties mounted and the reinforcements from headquarters were delayed. However, this did not dampen these brave men and women's grit and resolve. On the contrary, it only made them determined, stronger, and made them adapt to fighting alone. Consequently, the Order requested permission from the Cura to initiate a technological upgrade program with, with the Pan-Oceanian military complex's primary contractor for servo-powered armour, Omnia Corp. The result of the program was the Salios Mark II armor, a colossal piece of equipment with holographic replicant capacity that was successfully deployed at the beginning of the middle stages of the Paradiso Third Offensive. The Knights of the Holy Sepulchre had a chance to take part in the second wave of evacuations from Runeberg in a rerun of Operation Waterloo, holding their ground to buy time for the shuttles to take off carrying civilians and the injured. As on previous occasion, the first thing they did in fuel view of the enemy while risking being shot by hidden snipers was to draw their swords kiss the cross guards, and draw a line on the ground, a boundary that adversaries would only be able to cross after drenching it with the blood of a sepulchrous knight who had marked it. The tags of the military orders are no different than the tags of Pan Oceania, in that they are of great quality and quantity. Military order tag doctrine is plain and simple. Tags are the tip of a vanguard, utilising their religious fervour, advanced weaponry, marksmanship and devastating close combat abilities that means that they can counter any threat, be it the behemoth, avatar or raicho, secretive marut or the so-called pride of Yujing, the guja. No matter the foe, the serf and the tikbalan rise to the call. Volatas dit, God's will, motto of the serf cavalry, the father officers of the different Pan-Oceanian military orders, Hospitaller, Teutonic, Santiago, Holy Sepulchre or Montesa bear the duty of leading the vanguard of faithful troops into the heated battle. In the thick of combat, raptured by the calling of God, Father officers are ready to storm the gates of hell itself. These bold warriors strike with no fear of death, for they are imbued with the power of Christ. This religious fervour has led to such a high number of casualties amongst the order's officers that it has decided to equip them with a remote presence, heavy combat unit. Based on the Stingray Tag series, a number of modifications were introduced to the base model to adapt it to the particular needs of the Knights and the military orders. The sensitivity of the haptic system was enhanced to achieve an increased reaction time and a hand-eye coordination, thus maximising these units' capability for close combat, the kind of fighting that pilots of all orders always favour. Moreover, these Tag's vertical movement capability was upgraded in order to provide them with a greater mobility to get closer to the enemy and fall on them like angelic entities that they were named after. Currently the Seraphs are the most conspicuous element of any military or strike force, always battling on the front lines, unleashing the fury of God with their weapon systems and through the ox box accompanying them as the true harbingers of doomsday. 
Skirmishers are a new, odd addition to the military orders that while many knights boast about honour, the command structure of the military orders understand that honour won't win wars and those who use subterfuge will be more likely to win the day with less resources expended. Whether the wider orders are aware of the skirmishers actions, it does not matter to the Trinitarians. They have their orders and they know what is required of them. Trinitarians are fascinated by big mysteries, so they have devoted their lives to the studying the mystery of the Holy Trinity, the great paradox of God being one and three at the same time. Most of the greatest enigmas of the Christian religion and subject to theological debate throughout the centuries. But neither the human sphere nor church are experienced times that would allow a simple contemplative life. This age requires men and women committed to bringing about the fulfillment of God's plan. For this reason, the Trinitarians took their subject of study as model behaviours they should follow. They would become three totally different things at the same time. Scholars and saviours, but at the same time executioners. Instead of merely delving into great theological questions, the Trinitarians would also concern themselves with the unfortunate and helpless, and they would fight evils and the enemies of their faith wherever they found them. For this purpose, they created the so-called Third Rule, a select group of not only those well-versed in theological study, like the members of the First Rule, with a vocation of redemption, like the members of the Second Rule, but with the added task of confronting all those who obstruct the work of the Church and God's plan. The members of this third rule, known as Tertiarians, are instructed in the techniques for special operations, raids and covert activity. They are trained by the professionals from pan Oceanian military complex and the Hexadrone instructors. Many of them belong to the ranks of the Order Sergeants, men and women who have decided to commit themselves even further to their faith and their duty to God. Inspired by the units of mercy of the Order of the Hospital and followed the redemptive principles of the Trinitarian Order. The Tertiary favours aimed at freeing captives. However, beside prisoners of war, the Trinitarians are most concerned about civilians and innocents who are swept away by the relentless and indiscriminate tide of every conflict. The hospices and charity shelters where the Trinitarians carry out their redemptive and charitable work often serve as undercover bases of operations for the Tertiarians, and all of them, at least one member of the Third Rule, usually serves as both security detail and a forward agent for those pressing situations where their services are required. These mysterious scholars have mastered their techniques of becoming invisible, something that takes far more than advanced technology thanks to the highly specialised training that is so necessary for their operational requirements. Tertiarians are usually followed in sensitive operations that require the utmost provision and for effectiveness because the lives of good people in fortunate circumstances are often at stake. For a tertiarian, there is no margin for error because it will always be either a life of an innocent in danger or perhaps his or her own life on the edge of the abyss. This is one reason why their modus operandi is based on self and secrecy. It's a matter of survival but also of optimising their offensive power. God's plan is about a lot more than saving civilians, sometimes requiring tackling evil directly, face to face. Evil can manifest in the form of an alien in the service of an extraterrestrial AI or in that an enemy of the church, adversaries against whom there is no room for compassion. And the tertiarians will be as implicable as they are efficient because this is their task, to unveil mysteries, save the innocent and be the Lord's executing hand in the human sphere. So that was my video on the lore of the units of the military orders. I hope you enjoyed this and if you did, like and subscribe. This took a lot of effort and a lot of audio. I think the heavy infantry section alone is like 40 minutes before I cut it down and it's probably going to be cut down to something like 20. You, you'll see because you'll be watching this and listening. So yeah, um, like, comment and subscribe. Thank you so much for watching.